Good morning, Chapel Rock. It's good to be with you. Uh, if, if we haven't met, I am Pastor Brandon. I am the executive pastor here. And uh, you may have heard Pastor Casey is out today. And so it's, it's my turn. And this is the first time I've had the opportunity to preach here since May 21st. It's been a while. I'm excited. And I want to do something that I didn't do. I thought about doing when I came on the 21st. But you know, I was a newbie. And I didn't want you to think I was weird. And now I've been here long enough, you know I'm weird. So that's, that's just okay. So here's what we're going to do. We're all going to stand up. And we've got one of these, right? You've got one, I've got one. Okay, so everybody, I need you to come in. And Sherry, my wife, will you come up here? We're going to take a family photo because there are things we want to remember. Come on, stand up. This is part of the sermon, folks. Preaching is a participatory sport. Come on, it's okay. Yeah, come on. All right, come on in. All right. Oh, yeah, look at this. Okay. Here they come, it's great. You guys look awesome, awesome. All right, we're gonna take a few of these. All right, praise Jesus. You guys look amazing, <laughs> praise Jesus. Amen, thank you, thank you. All right, now I just took a selfie with my wife. Uh, what I want you to do now is get out your own cell phone, and you're going to want to do this. There were people at the end of the last service, and they're like, oh, shoot, I didn't do what Brandon said. And they were pulling out their phone at the end. Trust me, you're going to want to do this. Take a selfie with the people you're with right now. Just, just do it. Take it. You know, capture your family. If you don't have a, a cell phone with you, lean into somebody else. Photobomb them. It's okay. We're photobombing for Jesus. It's all right. Yeah. And trust me, Casey knows all about this. He's doing it too, and I'll tell you why later. This is actually part of the sermon. I know, it sounds weird. All right, man, you guys are having fun with it. That's awesome. Yeah, that's okay. Jesus loves us having fun. This is good, clean fun. All right, well, why don't we go to the Lord in prayer and see if he can redeem the rest of our time now that we've all acted crazy. Father God, we thank you so much for the privilege of worshiping you. We thank you that you are Emmanuel. You are the God who is with us. We thank you, Lord, that you are present here now. And Lord, may the words that are shared here be your message. And may they not uh, go without hitting their mark. May we not leave here unchanged. Lord God, May you continue to be glorified through the rest of this service and the rest of this day and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Anyway, I thought we fixed that last. Okay. So two weeks ago, Casey, Pastor Casey started a new sermon series, and then Fred continued, Pastor Fred continued it last week. So two weeks ago, we discussed uh, some junkyard theology. And the first thing was that, uh, what was it Casey talked about? He talked about uh, that everything happens for a reason, and that's junk theology. And then Pastor Fred talked about the concept of luck and superstition, and, and th that's junkyard theology. And in both cases, they went to the Word, and they identified how, uh, how God has communicated His truth to us to follow. And we're going to do that again today. I really like what Fred said last week. He said, we are addressing stinking thinking. I learned that phrase for the first time about 20 years ago in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And I, I really, I think it identifies this series well. That's what we're doing. But the truth is, more than we probably want to admit, the stinking thinking gets into us. We allow it, whether we realize it or not, it creeps in. And so as we dig into this, recognize if, if you feel that, oh, I've, I've done that. We all have. And we all need the reminder. So that's what God's giving us today. So I get the privilege of talking about relativism. And uh, believe it or not, that's an entire philosophical train of, uh, of study. We're not going to get into that too much. But you've probably heard people say, well, it's all relative during an argument or something or a debate. 
Well, the idea is that there's, uh, you know, there's more than one truth or something like that. In, in fact, uh, look here in the concise Oxford Dictionary says relativism is the doctrine that knowledge, truth, and morality exist in relation to culture, society, or historical context, and they are not ab absolute. So according to that, depending upon where you're from and wh whatever situation you came from, that's how you base truth. Well, I think, if, I think we could probably get a more concise version of that definition. Let's, let's see. Yeah, that works. Uh, relativism is the denial of any absolute standard of truth or morality. That's from the Dictionary of Theological Terms. I'm, I'm grateful that they sum it up a little bit easier. But here's the thing. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've just been to church before, you probably know that Christians affirm that there is absolute truth. His name is Jesus. We, we do believe that. However, it becomes very easy in the society we live in that there are arguments for, you know, acceptance and honoring other people and such. And sometimes there is a temptation to just say, yeah, it's all relative. Or another thing that we can fall into is on the total other end of the spectrum where we lean so much into what God says in his word that it becomes a list of rules you have to follow. And it's less about relationship and it becomes just legalism. So we need to be careful of both of these things, that we don't hyper-respond to our community and our culture and demand absolute truth so much so that we just say, you guys aren't living the rules, I am. And we put ourselves up on a pedestal. So legalism is the excessive adherence to the de details of the law, especially to the letter rather than the spirit. Now, it doesn't mean that the law isn't there. It doesn't mean that God's rule isn't there. It's just that when we start making it about following the rules rather than following the person of Jesus, we lose sight of the relationship. And believe it or not, that can be very hard to thread the needle on. Especially in our culture where you, we literally have a culture... That's okay. Sometimes I feel that way. Uh, it, it, it's all right. I start crying and I need to cry. It's okay. So. But sometimes it's just hard to, to know where do, where do I stand? What do I say? How do I respond to this situation? And the good news is Jesus actually spoke directly to this. And it comes at a time when his disciples were really confused. They didn't know exactly how to respond because the things Jesus was talking about, they were confusing and they were tough to hear and they were having some doubts of their own. So if you want to open your Bibles to John chapter 14, that's where we're going to go. But let me give you some of the, the background of this pa uh, passage where we're at. Starting in chapter 13 of the book of John, we have the scene of the upper room where uh, Jesus is meeting with his disciples, and they have the Lord's Supper, and uh, coming out of the Passover meal that they share. But in this particular time, after his betrayer, Judas, has been exposed, and Judas leaves, Jesus starts talking about how he's going to leave and go to the Father. He's pointing to the fact he's going to die and rise again and then come back. And he's using somewhat obscure language and how he's talking about it. the disciples get really confused and they say lord we don't know the way to the father how do we get there and jesus winds up saying this i am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through me you think well that settles it right but, but they still were confused and they still asked questions but this passage actually has a lot to say to our situation today. Uh, the relativist would say, ah, yeah, that sounds like a lot of dogma and religion. I don't like that. You know, that's good for you Jesus followers. I'm not sure about that. But then the legalist, they read this and they say, hey, I got, I got three check marks right there. I got the way, the truth, and the life. I can, do, I can do that. All right, cool. You better be doing it too because I'm going to be here with my checklist. I think this thing every time I turn. Yeah, let's try that. 
Maybe that's a little better. Sorry about that, those of you who are online. We're glad you're here. Please don't get scared off by that. But anyway, before we start making assumptions on what that means, whether relativism or legalism or whatever, it's really good to start asking questions when you read the Bible about the context, about how the original audience would have heard this. Now, the disciples who are there, they have walked with Jesus for about three and a half to four years at this point. And along the way, they probably wanted to make some memories too, just like we did. They probably, well, they didn't take snapshots, a little early for cameras. But in their mind, they, they harness some memories. And so I want to walk through several snapshots I think they may have had playing in their minds and see if we can capture what some of this meaning is. So the first snapshot, we find it in Matthew chapter 3, is the baptism of Jesus. It actually takes place, uh, or it's alluded to, in all four of the Gospels. But Matthew gives us the most specific uh, discussion of what happens. Jesus comes to be baptized, and when John, he lowers him down in the water and raises him back up, and when he comes up out of the water, the, the heavens part. The glory of God shines down upon him. The Holy Spirit in the shape of a dove comes down upon Jesus. And then God speaks audibly and everybody can hear him say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Don't you want to hear God say that about you? Oh yeah, this is my child whom I'm well pleased. John the Baptist, you know, he was there serving a purpose as the forerunner of the Messiah. And he sees Jesus come up to the Jordan River and there's large crowds and Jesus says, hey, will you baptize me? See, this almost didn't happen because John the Baptist said, uh, no, 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 I need, to, I need to be baptized by you, Jesus. And Jesus said, no, 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 let it be so now. Let's look at Jesus' response right here. Jesus replied, let it be so now. Let's do this baptism thing now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Hold on to that word for just a minute, righteousness. Then John consented. It's hit my collar. That's what it is. Oh. Might have been a fashion faux pas this morning. Sorry. Okay. Don't you find it odd that Jesus is talking about we need to fulfill all righteousness? Because I'm pretty sure if we look in the dictionary in heaven that it's going to be there. He is, his picture is going to be right next to the word righteousness. Jesus is the definition of righteousness. So what's that about? Well, whether you're studying the original Koine Greek or you're studying the, uh, the Latin that came later or Old English, right, wiseness is the word. Righteousness is not a word you can perform on your own. It is a relational word. Righteousness is about living in right relationship with somebody else. It's about obedience. Righteousness is about living rightly, obediently to God. And Jesus is saying, this is the way that we follow God's heart by humbling ourselves and repenting of sin, which this was a baptism of the repentance of sin, which Jesus didn't have sin, so he's doing it symbolically. And we are buried and raised to new life. That's the truth of God, that when we apply to the way we live, we have the opportunity to live a life that God always intended. Isn't that awesome? And I'm wondering if those are the types of thoughts that are rolling around in, in the disciples' minds, because some of them were there, they witnessed this. But the next snapshot, this one is almost like, it's just really curious, right at the beginning of Matthew chapter 4, right after the baptism, right after God says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, the Holy Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The Bible says it. And I don't know if that's actual footage, but uh, I don't think so. But I, I tell you what, I, I think that must be somewhat how it was like. You know, he's hungry, he's starving. 40 days, 40 nights, no food. And along comes Satan. He has three temptations that he wants to offer. And the first one is about that physical need of, of food. Turn these rocks into bread. Have a snack, Jesus. The second one's a little more obscure. And if you study a little bit, you find out 
He, Satan takes Jesus to the top of the temple and says, throw yourself down. And he actually quotes scripture saying, you know, the Bible says that you won't even hurt your heels. The angels are going to come and protect you. And uh, yeah, he's actually uh, trying to get Jesus to think about fulfilling a prophecy that was made in the intertestamental time. Some of the rabbis said that Jesus, well, sorry, the Messiah would just miraculously show up at the temple. And then everybody would know he was the Messiah. Well, Satan saying, you could do it this way. And then the third one is, just bow down and worship me, and I'll give you all of the nations. I'll just give them to you, because I stole them from you, and then you can have them. You don't need to go to the cross. You don't need to die. You don't need to sacrifice. But each time, Jesus responds using God's truth in the way he responds, pointing to the life that he was supposed to live. He says, no, no, no. My, it says... The scripture says, which is Jesus saying, my daddy says, it's, yeah, that's in the Brandonian version, uh, God, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then the second time, he says, no, scripture says, don't put my dad to the test. Don't put God to the test. And the third one, he says, oh no, absolutely not, because this is written in my dad's hand. You will worship God only. But get, get away from me, Satan. You're just a bad angel. A bad apple of an angel. But get out of here. And so he flees. So with, I don't know that they were there. I think he was alone. But when the disciples hear about this, they recognize that Jesus' way is about leaning on God's truth that delivers them to new life. And Jesus lived it so he could teach it, so that we could follow it. I bet there are more. I bet we've got another snapshot here. What we, we got? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, it wasn't only Satan that wanted to trip Jesus up. There were religious leaders that loved trying to trip Jesus up. Jesus was getting pretty popular, and so in the week leading up to uh, the, uh, the Passover, they would gather around in the temple courts, and they would ask all kinds of questions. And eventually they'd get around the discussion, you know, how does one experience eternal life? Uh, what are the most important commandments? And Jesus in Luke turns the question on them and says, well, what does it say in the law? And they, being good Jewish teachers, respond with the Shema, which is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And then they say, well, the second one's like it. And they actually quote out of Leviticus, which Jesus in other passages uh, does as well, love your neighbor as yourself. And then one of them, ready to trip Jesus up, says, ah, yeah, but uh, who's our neighbor? <laughs> I think Jesus is like, yeah, you just set that right there on the tee for me. That's nice. I'm going to hit this one out of the park. It's probably his second most famous parable, the Good Samaritan. He tells it then. This is the context. And he says, you know, there's a Jewish man who was going to worship God at the temple here in Jerusalem. And on his way, he was overtaken by robbers and beaten, left for dead. And as he lay there at the side of the road, bleeding, dying, there was a Jewish priest and a Jewish rabbi. They came over here to the other side of the road, and they're like, oh, yeah, we can't help him. Oh, uh, sorry. And the reason probably is because they want to stay ceremonially clean so they can go do their job and lead worship. But they didn't care for this man. The person who does is a Samaritan. And a Samaritan, they were not even considered human by most Jewish people at that day. They were considered half-breeds. But here comes a Samaritan and leans down and takes care of this Jewish man and mends their wounds. Takes him to an inn. Pays not only for the room but for his medical care and says, hey, if this doesn't cover the bill, when I come back through, I'll pay for the rest. And Jesus said, okay. So who was this man's neighbor? Who? And the person who asked the question said the one who had compassion on him. Couldn't even bring himself to say the Samaritan. But Jesus' teaching, Jesus the way he lived, Jesus the way he handled God's truth. Because remember, they started with God's truth out of the book of Deuteronomy and Leviticus. 
was always about handling it with grace and mercy. He lived the way, applied the truth, so that not just us, but everybody can receive this life. I, mean, I know we got another one. I'm pretty sure we got another Oh, yeah. Oh, this, is, this is a good one. John chapter 8 is this scene where Jesus once again is being, you know, he's, he's being tested by the religious leaders. But this time they do it in a savage way, using a, a marred reputation of a woman. They bring to Jesus there in the temple courts a woman caught in the act of adultery. And there's a crowd, and they all got rocks. I don't know about you, but last time I heard adultery was not a solo sport. They were missing somebody. Some people think that, that the guy was in the crowd. Don't know. But what we do know is they, they've got Jesus, and they say, Jesus, it's written in the law that we need to stone this girl. She was caught in the act of adultery. What do you say? But Jesus is the smartest person that ever lived because Jesus is God. He knew that they were setting him up because if he says, yes, we got to stone her, well, then they're going to take his words over to the Romans and say, Jesus is trying to issue a death penalty without your permission. And then they would hand Jesus over to the Romans because only the Romans would issue a death penalty. That's why when Jesus was crucified, they had to go to Pontius Pilate. They needed Roman authority to kill Jesus. The Jews couldn't do it. But on the other hand, if Jesus then says, ah, you know, uh, it does say that in the law. Go ahead and kill her. They, I'm, I'm sorry, we've already covered that. If Jesus says, no, don't kill her, then, well, they're going to go to the Jewish people and say, he can't be your Messiah. He can't be a good rabbi. He doesn't even follow God's law. So one way or another, they've got him trapped. But Jesus doesn't do that. In the same way we're talking about threading the needle of, of uh, relativism versus legalism, Jesus, he kneels down and he starts writing in the dirt. You know, there's three trains of thought what he's writing. Do you guys know what he's writing? Yeah, me neither. If you know, let me know, because I'd love to know, because Scripture doesn't tell us. But Jesus starts writing. Theologians suppose it's one of a few things. Number one is he might be writing the actual law out of, uh, out of the scriptures, which says, yeah, you got to kill them both. Caught in the act of adultery, the man and the woman deserve to die. But they're missing the guy. That's number one. Number two, he may have written the name of the man who was taking part in this. Or number three, he could have been writing the names of the crowd. It'd be like John, dash, lust. Uh, Jennifer, dash, uh, you know, whatever, fill in the sin. And he's just listing their sins. We don't know. But these have been speculated by theologians over the world. What we do know is whatever he wrote had all the people reading it start thinking. And one by one, starting with the oldest members of the crowd, they dropped their rocks and they walked away. And then Jesus turns to the woman who was caught in the act of adultery there in her shame and her pain and her misery, no, even feeling as though even if they don't kill her, that her life is over. And Jesus leans down and grabs her hand. He says, did nobody condemn you? And she said, no. He says, then I don't condemn you either. And he helps her up. He says, go and sin no more. You see what Jesus did there? He demonstrated a way of living God's truth that allowed for life in those who changed their path. Because we're all guilty and we all need his mercy and compassion. And I think the disciples were thinking about that. I got one more, one more snapshot. And I think this one is probably the one that they were thinking about the most. You see, in John chapter 13, when Jesus and his disciples, all 12 of them, gather in that room, there's nobody to wash anybody's feet. 
And, you know, the disciples are thinking, you know, our feet, they stink. They're dirty. And they were. Now, I believe in, uh, I believe in you know, object learning. So let's all take off our shoes. And uh, you all laugh? No? Well, let me tell you. I'm just kidding. The truth is, is if we did, it would not hold a candle to the stench and the filth that were on their feet because they walked around in, in the same streets and everything that were made of dust and mud and dirt, but also the animals walked on those too. And so there's manure and, and just all kinds of stuff. And that's why it was always the lowest of the low servants that washed people's feet. And the disciples are trying to figure out, and like, okay, who's going to do this? I don't know. And probably some of them were like, well, you know, Philip hasn't done much these days. Maybe, maybe he should do this, you know. But ultimately, they look around, and Jesus is gone. He comes back in. He's got a towel wrapped around his waist, and he kneels down, and he washes all of their feet. He washes Peter's feet, but before he does, Peter's like, no, absolutely not. And Jesus says, if I don't wash you, you have none of me. And so he's like, then wash all of me. He's like, no, your feet will do. (laughs) Your feet will do. But I want you to think who's in that room. I want you to think about this. It's not just Peter. It's not just John. It's not just the, the, you know, doubting Thomas. It's all of them. All 12 at this point. And all 12 would leave him the night, that night when he's arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. But one of them would betray him for 30 pieces of silver. His name was Judas Iscariot. And Jesus washed his feet. So suddenly, the way of Jesus and the truth that he taught starts ringing in their ears in my imagination. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your enemies. If you want to be great in the kingdom, be a servant of all. And Jesus doesn't just teach it. He lives it right there in front of him right there in front of Judas and all the rest of them. He showed them the way. He lived the truth. And he demonstrated what the life God wants us to live looks like. Why? It's not just so that we can go to heaven when we die. That's that's a nice perk. That's a really nice perk. That's the gravy. But the truth is, Jesus talks about it. Here, in John 13, verse 15. Look at what he says. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Isn't that awesome? He set an example. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. He's like, I'm the master. You're my servant. You you need to do this too. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. You will be blessed if you do them. That, in the verse before it says that the messenger, uh, the messenger is not greater than the one who sent him. Jesus would call them his apostles, ones sent. They were sent to live his way, teach his truth, so that those who hear the message could live the life God has for them. But Why? But why? If it's not just so we can go to heaven when we die, if it's, if it's, if it's, is it something more? Yeah. And this is when those selfies become important. We're going to get to those in just a second. But here, here's the real truth. It was always God's plan. The way and truth of Jesus are about restoring us to God's original plan to live a life that reflects him. Now let's jump all the way back to the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, okay? On the sixth day, we read about God creating humanity. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness. This is the Godhead. They're like having a holy huddle. It's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And they're saying, let's outdo ourselves and do this. And then it says, we're going to make mankind in our image. We're going to put them as rulers over all the living creatures on the earth. And then it goes on in the next verse. Get this. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. 
Men, women, it is important for us to recognize and honor one another in our role as God uh, image bearing people. And this is what makes uh, marriage so beautiful. You've got a, a woman and a man in a relationship with God the Father, and you have a reflection of the Trinity. Is that not beautiful? That is an amazing truth. And this is why it is absolute truth. The image and likeness of God. There's a, a phrase, a Latin phrase, imago Dei. It means image bearer. That phrase in Latin, imago Dei, is a very important concept. This is the reason why redemption and the plan of saving us is so important. Because our sin marred us. And Jesus came to redeem his father's plan of the precious humanity that he wanted to reflect his image for all eternity. And so he's making it possible, restoring us to the ability to bear the image and likeness of God. Keeps happening, I'm sorry. But we need to remember this. Anytime we choose a different way or a different truth, from that of Jesus is sin. Choosing a different way or a different truth from Jesus is sin. Whether it's, I'm going to make up whatever I think is true, or we hold to the scriptures in a way that he didn't intend for us to, making them a checklist. Those things will never lead to the life God made us for. Instead, we need to honor the spirit of the scriptures living the way of Jesus, embracing and embodying the truth of Jesus to live the life Jesus always wanted us to live. Eugene Peterson uh, wrote this amazing book called The Way of Jesus, and it's about this passage. And in it, he says something that, that's really startling. He says, you know, American, North American Christians, we are really big on the truth of Jesus. But a lot of times we fail to embrace the way of Jesus, living the way Jesus taught. And if we do that, we don't, we don't arrive at the life he wants us to live. We need to follow the way of Jesus, the truth of Jesus, to live the life he always wanted us to. So you're asking yourself now, so what in the world does this have to do with selfies? Why don't you pull up your selfies? Just pull out your cell phone. I got mine here. It's okay. Yeah, it's, it's okay. All right. The person in that selfie was created in the image and likeness of God. God made you, and he made you in his image, in his likeness, and he delights in you every time he sees you. Every time you open a selfie at this point or take one, I want you to remember that. The person on your phone is somebody that Jesus came to restore to the Imago Dei, to live the image and likeness of God in all you do. Isn't that not awesome? But there's even more than that. Oh, wait a second. We got, we got something we got to do. Okay. With those selfies, right now, Casey is in Vienna, Austria, and Jason is in Taiwan, and Kyle is in Missouri, uh, which might be a different country, some of you think. I came from there. So, uh, Anyway, let's send those selfies into social media world, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever is your favorite, whatever, I'm a Facebooker, so uh, at Chapel Rock, you know, uh, label it, and hashtag Imago Day. Because what we are experiencing today is not just you've got the B team leading uh, in preaching and such, but what you have right now is you have an opportunity to say, Chapel Rock is global. We even celebrated a team that's going to Columbia, the country, to, to uh, be witnesses for Jesus. But we're doing this, and it's not just for right now. See, the image-bearing nature is not just for time on earth today. It's for eternity. Yeah. In Revelation 19, there's this beautiful passage that we're going to experience. Are you a follower of Jesus? Anybody here? Follower of Jesus? Amen? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. If you're a follower of Jesus, been, been baptized, been redeemed, been restored, then you get to experience this. The day is going to come where Jesus is going to come back. It talks about this in Revelation 19. And the bride of Christ is going to gather together as a multitude. And we are going to celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb. And this is going to last for all eternity. 
In us, we are going to be fully restored to the image and likeness of God the way He always intended, and we're going to reflect each other for all eternity. You've got your cell phones there. A lot of people will use them as a mirror. Just think of that, this room full of mirrors. Eternity, you're going to see the reflection of God bouncing off of each and every person here. And not not only that, we get to experience that for eternity. We get to celebrate the presence of God and reflect His image for all eternity. And that's why it can't be relativism and it can't be legalism. It's got to be the way, truth, and life of Jesus. Because it's His way or it's no way. And because of that truth, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then we have something to celebrate and we're going to do that right now. Okay? As a follower of Jesus Christ, your name is going to be written down in glory, and we are going to be able to celebrate that for eternity. He has given you that name. So let's stand and sing and proclaim that truth.